Welcome to Fridays with a Forester. This is February 23rd. Uh, our topic today is tree and forest impacts from recent droughts and floods. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Gary Wyatt, Extension Educator with the University of Minnesota Extension and a Forestry Team member. And we have Lauren Beckus, which is our Regional Support Staff at Andover, and she's going to be monitoring our question A, Q and A, and also uh, the, the monitoring the webinar today. Thanks for joining us. And today's topic again is trees and forest impacts from our droughts and floods in recent years. And our speaker is Brian Schwindle. He's a forest health program coordinator with the Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota. And there's his uh, email address. And I'll show you this slide a little bit later during our Q&A. So this is a webinar, so we won't be seeing your faces and you will we'll be muted from the, the webinar today. So please enter your uh, questions in the Q&A box. Uh, it should be uh, at the bottom of your screen. And then uh, we usually try and end these webinars at 10, but if questions continue to come in and, and uh, we will try and address them past 10 o'clock. All of our webinars are recorded on a Z-link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. Brian, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll let you start sharing. Alrighty. Well, I really appreciate this uh, invitation to speak from extension. And so I'll just get going here. Um, to start off with, um, people, it seems, tend to just pay attention to what's happening in the here and now. We're all busy. And we oftentimes forget what happened last year or even within the last few years. And I'm here to remind you that in recent years, there's been a ton of flooding. And here are a series of statewide maps showing growing season precipitation. So precipitation from April through September and how those years in specific areas of the state rank on the all time record going back to 1895. And areas in the state on these maps that are pink or I'm very bad with my colors pink or light light pink or almost white those areas experienced um they they all lie within the top 90th percentile all time for all time growing season precipitations in other words um these areas circled they rank am amongst the 13th among the among the 13 wettest growing season growing seasons all time so you can see that in the last decade, um, some areas of the state, for example, if you just key in on central Minnesota, um, there, you know, it's areas of central Minnesota are circled in 2014, 2016, 2017, 2019. So it's been wet. And when you just take a look at the entire state, so um, the, the, the amount of precipitation that the entire state has received during the growing seasons, you can see that these years rank in the top 12 all time. 2014 was the 12th wettest, 2016 the seventh wettest, and 2019, 2019 the 11th wettest all time. Now, this is in more recent memory, of course. We've also had a lot of serious droughts. So these are the same sorts of maps that are that the DNR's climate team produces. Um, and these maps show basically the lowest 15% growing season precipitations. So they so the areas in brown or like maroon circled here, those all rank amongst the driest 19 years. Um, so again, you can see like 2021 and 2023 were statewide. They, those droughts covered extensive areas. And in fact, 2021 was the 11th driest year on record and 2023 was the ninth driest year on record for the entire state. So we've been having a lot of floods or a lot of excessive, I'll just say excessive precipitation and a lot of very dry, very dry years too. Now, this is the last sort of weathery graph I'm going to show again from our climate tree team. Actually, Kenny Blumenfeld sent me this this graph the blue the blue colored areas above the 
the midway point there. The midway point is the long-term average. So 1895 to 2023, the, the entire records average. The blue areas indicate um, above that average. So for the for when we look at five-year moving average. So in other words, the blue areas indicate kind of long-term ex periods of excessive precipitation. And the maroon areas below that horizontal midway point represent long-term dry periods. And you can see over here, this is 2023. You can see actually that we are we are we've recently entered a long-term dry period. And this this so this line just goes to the bottom of that long-term dry period in 2023 here. You can see the last time we reached that um kind of severity of long-term drought was in 2009. And before that, it was about in 1939. So that gives you an idea of how dry we are right now. Now, again, very recently, we came out of a long-term wet period statewide. Um, so <laughs> I wish I could quote uh, Kenny Blumenfeld, one of our statewide climatologists, but he said something like, we are currently in the driest, wettest period all time, something like that. Okay, so what are the general impacts to trees from both flooding and drought? Well, you get reduced photosynthesis. And if you get reduced photosynthesis, which is the process with how for, for how plants make their food from sunlight and carbon dioxide in the air, that's what photosynthesis is. If they can't do that or they can't do that as much, they, they have reduced growth. And if they have reduced growth, then they basically shut off production of their defensive compounds. So plants defend themselves against pests and pathogens through chemical means and also through anatomical means. Like for example, bark is a way that trees defend themselves against pests. But um, for the most part, I would say plants really, they, they produce a bunch of chemicals that protect themselves against pests and pathogens. When they are suffering from reduced photosynthesis due to flooding and drought, they don't produce many of those defensive compounds anymore. Um, for both flooding and drought stress, frequently you can't tell a tree is visually, you can't just look at a tree the year of drought or the year of flooding and 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 see this the stress some the symptoms of those floods and droughts frequently symptoms show up the next year or even two three four or five years after those events we aren't talking about grass here wimpy grass we're talking about 200 year old massive organisms like baroques like white pine they're huge They've they've been, they've been living for decades and they're tough. And for that reason, sometimes they it takes many years for them to show symptoms of stress. What are these symptoms that you get from flooding and drought? With kind of minor symptoms, you get discolored leaves sometimes. Sometimes you get premature leaf shedding. A little bit more severe symptoms, you get stunted leaves, and then of course you you get shoot dieback. So death from the on the outer crown, and you get root death, which of course you never can see. Root death, and then there's this positive feedback loop. So if you get root death, you get more shoot dieback, and eventually you can get death. It, the picture on the lower right just shows um, young white pines uh, dying because of standing in pooled water during the growing season. So that was an immediate, almost a, an immediate system, but those are smaller trees. Bigger trees, lots of times you get delayed symptoms. Another um, manifestation of both flooding and drought stress is they affect multiple species. Um, here's an image, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later in South Central Minnesota, showing that sugar maple on the left, it's a basswood in the middle, it's a Northern red oak on the right. You can see they're all displaying the same symptoms severe dieback, leaf discoloration, they're dying. Um, and then in response to really kind of acute drought stress of 2021, this is what happened. You get kind of the, the edges around the edges of leaves 
burn. We call it leaf leaf scorch. So there's a basswood on the top, a northern red oak on the left, or maybe a northern pin oak, and then a bur oak seedling on the right. And, and again, for with both, both flooding and drought stress, what happens afterwards, because you get reduced defensive compounds, pests that are opportunists, they aren't really aggressive when trees are healthy. But at, when trees are severely stressed, they can cause big problems. And I will kind of dive into this here in a little bit. That's two-lined chestnut borer on the left. That's an adult. Um, it's the most common insect pest of all of our oak species. And the white stuff on the root flare, kind of a big structural root that goes down into the ground at the base of a red pine, is shown there in the second from the right photo with all that white stuff on it right underneath the bark. I've taken the bark off. That's that's a fungus um, called armillaria. Another, another thing is that um, if trees suffer and survive flooding and drought stress, they take years to recover, maybe 10, maybe even more, if you get pretty severe dieback. Here's something I added right before I, I tuned in this morning. The other thing, and this is probably particularly true of Minnesota and Wisconsin, maybe, maybe Michigan too, you know, this part of the country where we have all these wetlands um, and different types of wetlands, we have forests growing right up to the edge of these wetlands. Um, it, I think it's, in, it's not intuitive that f trees growing right next to wetlands or right next to lakes, they actually have a harder time getting water because they have less soil to root, to, to grow roots into. Trees can't grow roots into completely waterlogged soil and they can't grow, for the most part, they can't grow roots right into lake water and then suck lake water out like it's like those roots are a hose. It doesn't work that way. Those roots, they're full of living cells and living cells need oxygen. And so trees and forests growing next or right immediately adjacent to wetlands, they, they have less soil to grow their roots. Therefore, they're more susceptible to droughts and floods. So here's an image that I took in Morrison County in central Minnesota in August 2021. Of It's like this upland oak forest that, that goes right up to a, a huge wetland. And you can see that within, the, you know, 10 years prior to me taking this photo, you had extreme flooding in 2014, 2016, 2017, and 2019. And then you had a really quite severe drought in 2021. And what happened is a lot of those trees around the wetland died. Um, we saw this in the air. I'm not sure exactly what year I didn't look it up. I took this photograph when we were doing our aerial survey. But if you look around these open grassy wetlands, you can see a halo of dead trees around them. And that's just because because of the waxing and waning of the surface area of these wetlands with floods and with droughts. Now specifically, I'm going to talk about oh, flooding here. Like I, I kind of mentioned this when I when I mentioned how roots are not like hoses. They need roots need oxygen. Um, I I forget the 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 general fact. This is very generally speaking, but like ninety percent of a tree's roots grow within the top twelve inches of the soil surface. Why is that? It's because they need oxygen. The deeper down you go, the less oxygen you have. So if you get flooding, roots suffocate, or they just kind of go dormant, which shuts down photosynthesis, which actually sometimes can cause drought stress above the ground because the, the upper canopy can't get water from roots that are dormant or dying. In particular, with flooding, you get um, infection, you get a lot of spread and infection of these organisms called water molds. You can kind of think of them like fungi, but the, the major difference between water molds and fungi is that they produce these spores that can swim and they swim to infect roots. So the, the base of that curly Q red arrow there goes from one of these spores called a zoospore and they swim around and they, and they, they can find stressed roots. 
and they infect them and then they kill kill the roots. So the root system on the left there, so on the right picture, that root system on the on the left was infected by Phytophthora. The one on the right was not. And I'm sure many of you have heard of the Irish potato famine. The Irish potato famine was caused by a Phytophthora species. Phytophthora is one of the most major pa plant pathogens worldwide, causes all kinds of problems. Um, just kind of giving you some case studies. So here, that pink dot is in northern Pine County, kind of, kind of a little south of Moose Lake, Minnesota. And if you take a look at the weather record from 2012 to 2019, you can see that there were a lot of seasonal um, wet periods, like extremely wet periods, like 2012 was the wettest spring on record in that area. Um, there were a few really severe droughts too. 2012 was the 10th driest fall on record. 2018, the ninth driest spring on record. Several upland, they're, they're upland oak forests in that northern Pine County. They look like this. Um, and they've looked like this for quite a while. This image was taken in 2019. And around a lot of these trees, you can actually see wet loving plants like cattails and um, certain sedges that grow in on wet sites. And so some of these sites have become actually a little wetter. And um, the DNR is collaborating a little bit, kind of helping a researcher out, Nick Rajtar with the University of Minnesota Department of Plant Pathology, find research sites because Nick is doing kind of a baseline assessment of what Phytophthora species are 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 in our forests. And at this site here in Northern Pine County, he found this Phytophthora cactorum associated with, correlated immediately underneath some like a dead like a red oak that had severe dieback a dead red oak and then a dead basswood too so it's it's likely that the phytophthora had something to do with that death here's another example um down south of the twin cities like an hour or so in nurse strand wood nurse strand big wood state park nurse strand big wood state park and again the weather record just shows how much flooding this area has sustained or how much, again, it flooding, when I say flooding, it doesn't need to be pooled water on the soil surface. It can be completely saturated soil, soil with almost no pores to provide oxygen to those roots for an extended period of time. And you can see it's it's been really wet there and the a, a large portion of this state park has basically died off because highly, highly likely because of extremely saturated soils. So here's an image in 2018. I showed this earlier. Here's a nearby image showing multiple tree species dying or dead. And this site is actually, I just heard a presentation on Wednesday uh, of this site and a lot of wet species that like wet soils are actually starting to kind of do better on this site. For example, ash. So this is just kind of more of the work I've done over the years, um, showing these areas that I've been in, just showing kind of general decline. And it's all it's all closely correlated with really wet weather and um, plants, younger plants that are starting to grow around these trees that like wet soils. So, okay, so for the take, sake of time, I'm gonna kind of speed up here, drought impacts. So bark beetles are notorious for attacking really stressed red pine. So here's a case study up in Roseau County in 2021 showing this red pine plantation, which was thinned the previous winter, um, starting to show symptoms of bark beetle attack. 2021 there was the 11th driest summer on record. Bark beetles, they, they feed on the inner bark and cambium right underneath the bark of, of all kinds of trees, broadleaf trees, and and conifers and our probably most famous bark beetle are these ip species and and the tricky thing is that trees under attack frequently don't don't show symptoms until the fall even sometimes over the winter their 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 crowns don't change color so it's difficult to respond and take management action to to a bark beetle attack they leave these exit holes, like if you see a red pine and it has these exit holes all over it, you know that tree has been attacked by ips most likely, and it probably is not going to be attacked anymore, and it's probably not a threat 
to the surrounding forest anymore. I would leave that as a wildlife tree if it's already been fully utilized by bark beetles. Um, the team I'm a part of, we've we've written, um, we, we have our, a website and it has a lot of management advice on. The easiest way to find advice on bark beetles is just to, to do a internet search, search Minnesota DNI, DNR, find bark beetles. And you'll hopefully find our landing page. Um, I think though, maybe even more popular than bark beetles are flat-headed wood borers in terms of their notoriety for attacking stressed, highly, highly drought stressed forests. Um, the most famous one of these, well, maybe second in popularity in Minnesota is two-lined chestnut borer. It attacks red oaks. The characteristic indicator of two-lined chestnut borer attack is shown on the right there where you get the outer canopy was, was killed the the previous year or really early in the spring the mid part of the tree died that year it, it kind of looks red and then the very sometimes a very bottom like a single branch on the lower canopy may still be green but you get this dead red green appearance you kind of get these galleries these feeding tunnels between the bark and the wood um, that kind of look like somebody did an etch-a-sketch on them they all these organisms leave d-shaped exit holes um bronze birch borer actually might be more famous than two-line chestnut borer in minnesota lore it causes the same symptoms though almost this dead red green or dead orange green leaves hang on for a long time they caught they they caught they create these serpentine or back and forth squiggly um feeding tunnels or galleries underneath the bark, and then their adults leave these exit holes that are flat on one side or D-shaped. Bronze poplar borer attacks our, our aspen woods. Same thing. All right, just, uh, just some comments here about two-line chestnut borer. We're seeing a lot of two-line chestnut borer in Minnesota from the southern border up to the northwestern tip. Here's an image I shot in the Rum River State Forest in Mille Lacs County last year. Where the, the character one landscape characteristic of actually drought damage period is kind of scattered mortality and scattered dieback, and you get that with two-line chestnut borer. Um, populations often outbreaks start about a year after in the initial severe drought, and they last for about three years. Um, a, a, and a very important indicator of two-line chestnut borer is that dead leaves persist in the canopy for weeks or months. And here's here's an image I shot in Dakota County of the same trees over the course of two months. And you can see that they've lost very few of their leaves. This greatly con contrasts two-line chestnut borer symptoms with oak wilt. So if these trees had oak wilt, um, in September 2006, they would have rapidly lost a lot of their leaves, like maybe 50% of their leaves at that point, maybe set, maybe 90% of their leaves at that point. They wouldn't have held their leaves for so long. Okay, on to another organism that's, that's infamous for attacking drought stress trees is armillaria. We don't have a good way of tracking armillaria um, population swings over time like we do with insects. It's a disease. Diseases are just harder to, to track over time. But they create that flat white sheet. It's called a mycelial fan that grows between the bark and the wood. Um, symptoms I've already talked about, you know, discolored leaves, stunted leaves, dieback, death. Sometimes, frequently, almost always, Armillaria acts in concert with these flat-headed wood borers that I mentioned, but sometimes it can act by itself. Here's an example in my previous life when I worked for Wisconsin DNR where you, you had actually all across northern Wisconsin, you had widespread aspen decline. It, it followed many, many years of significant drought. Um, here's a shot in shore view of an oak that was being killed solely by armillaria root disease. It's not easy to distinguish this kind of these things from oak wilt but in this case this tree on the on kind of the left there with the dead leaves it died over the course of two years so we knew this northern red oak was not being killed by oak wilt and of course there's the mycelial fan the, the fungal sheet at head height that you can see on the left again ramsey county 
um, before I took this photo, it had three consecutive extremely dry growing seasons. And our malaria doesn't really discriminate between trees. It'll attack just, there are many species of our malaria in our woods. It's a native part of our ecosystem, native part of our soils. You, the, you cannot, you can't realistically control populations of our malaria. They're just opportunistic. When trees are stressed, they'll kill, they'll kill a lot of trees sometimes. Um, and they'll kill regenerating trees or seedlings and saplings frequently. And you can see here, in a in a in a underneath a red pine plantation in Pine County, a lot of the red pine seedlings and saplings were dying. It was because of our malaria. Now I'm going to move on to decline. Decline is almost kind of an academic term, but I think it's important to to bring up here. Um, basically. It's complicated when we're looking at why trees are dying and why forests are dying. It's complicated. It's it's not easy like diagnosing what's killing a corn plant or grass. These again, these trees are really complicated organisms that are difficult to study. They're difficult to investigate. Um, but decline. There are three components of decline. And this is kind of again, this is it's con it's a helpful concept, but to have decline, you need you need forests or trees to be predisposed to decline. So things that can predispose trees to decline are old age, compacted soils, overly dense forest where the trees are competing for water resources and light resources with one another, and then you have something that kind of kicks off the decline. It's called an inciting agent, but it's kind of the kicking off of it. It, it starts it. Frequently, it's excessive precipitation and or drought and or defoliation by things like forest tent caterpillar, which we haven't had much of recently. And after that kind of kickoff starts, then you have symptoms developing an attack from secondary pests that I've I've already described it. Two-line chestnut borer, our malaria, bronze poplar borer, all of those that I just talked about. Those kind of, those are the things that, what's the term? They're the final death knell frequently of these trees. But before they, before they happen, you need these forests to be predisposed. You need some sort of agent that kicks it all off, like extreme drought, for example. So here's a picture that I shot this May in Stearns County. So this is a perfect example of oak decline. These are old bur oaks. They're growing adjacent to, in some cases, open water or like a wet meadow full of cattails. Um, they were likely flooded in 2010, 2014, and 2019 because those years are were amongst the top 10 wettest years in Stern County. They were severely drought stressed in 2021, and they they almost certainly are dying because of our malaria and two line chestnut borer. Now that uh, that all those those four points I have on the left in orange there, that's a mouthful. It's much much easier to just say this this you're seeing oak decline here. All right, so here's another shot. This is down near Albert Lee. I shot this photograph in August 2017. Nearly the identical situation. It's just several years before. You have old oak burrows growing next to wet meadows. See all the cattails there? 2012 was the 11th driest growing season on record. And then 2013, 15, and 16 were amongst the west, the wettest. And I did, there's, there was armillary and two-line chestnut borer in there. Final example is Anoka County last year. This is on um, Minnesota DNR's Carlos Avery Wildlife Management Area. You have a lot of northern pin oaks dying from two-line chestnut borer. Now, it would be correct to say these forests are suffering from drought. It would also be correct to say there's a two-line chestnut borer outbreak going on here. It would also be correct to say these forests are in decline. Um, there is no standard for, unfortunately, for, for there's no national standard for us to track these things by these categories, which makes summarizing these problems problematic. Um, similarly, you may have seen an, uh, an analysis that University of Minnesota did recently on deaths by COVID-19. And you kind of have the same thing going on here. If um, somebody who is like 99 walked, like died, um, it's up to 
some medical professional to declare cause of death. That person may have died of COVID-19, but they also may have had a lot of other issues because they were 99 and it's up to the professional to, to decide what caused the death. So basically it's complicated. All right, so final two slides here. There's a lot of other drought related problems I didn't describe here, a lot. I, I did describe, I think, what's probably the most serious and significant, but there's a ton of problems that become a lot big, a lot more problematic after or during severe droughts. And here's just a not close to a laundry list of them. Um, the, you know, so there's latent pathogens, like I just showed, there's canker diseases, there's borers. There's kind of a small outbreaks of linden borers in Mankato that have been happening in the city of Mankato for a number of years. Minneapolis officials just found a, a, an outbreak in South Minneapolis because of linden borer recently. Um, I think it's probably because of all of these years where we've had extreme weather. Um, scale issues. Scales look like some sorts of scales kind of look like warts on twigs. They produce honeydew. Um, honey, like you can see the all the honeydew flecks on that basswood picture on the right. Sometimes sooty mold grows on top of the honeydew because it's just like mold growing on your bed on your bread at home in a plastic bag. The sooty mold is black. You can see it on the jack pine in the center bottom there. Um, scales tend to do really well with droughts too, as do many insects. So what did what to do about this? Don't stress your trees. I mean, the the thing is, again, we we can't really do anything about the weather. Um, I think all we can do in many cases is not stress trees. And humans stress their yard trees a lot. And I didn't even list here on the left all the reasons, all the ways that people stress their trees. But I think the most important thing is right now is if we, we continue to be in drought, water your trees. And it's not realistic to water more than many, more than, I don't know, one, two, three yard trees. I mean, pick out your favorite ones, put a drip irrigation hose right underneath the edge of their canopy called the drip line. Turn that hose on once a week, leave it run all night long. If we're talking a big, huge baroque and continue that or once every one week or once every two weeks for the duration of the drought. And that's probably going to go the longest way to protecting your oak from dying and or being attacked from two-line chestnut borer or armillaria. For forests, if you're a, if you're a, you know, if you own 20 acres and you were planning to thin this year, um, why not wait? The, the very short term effect of thinning is to mimic drought stress. So if you thin right before a drought or during a drought, you're exacerbating the all the negative impacts of drought. Now the thing is though, thinned forests are more resilient to drought. So it's crucial that um, if you have a forest that typically requires thinning, not all forests do, but many forest types do benefit from thinning, um, work with a professional forester to assess if your forest needs thinning. A lot of our forests, I think, are probably overly dense. And so that also exacerbates the effects of drought. Rejuvenate your forests. You know, I showed a picture of northern pin oaks. Northern pin oaks aren't a long-lived species. Um, I don't, I, I think that socially, um, people think of forests as like, kind of magical places, but they're dynamic and they don't last forever. Trees die. So I've taken too long there. I will stop. We can chat. Brian, you can leave your slides on the screen for now in case you have to go back to uh, some of the questions that might uh, have a, a good slide to talk about. Sounds good. And uh, Lauren, can you start us out with the questions, please? Yep. First one, when there is a drought, do root molds die off? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> when there is, so here's here's something that it's hard for me to understand even um, because it's not intuitive. When there's a drought, 
several root diseases do better. The reason is, is because um, roots, when they're under drought, stress exude, the, the, the chemicals that they exude slightly change and certain pathogens like armillary root disease are actively attracted to those exudates, those chemicals that are released. And because trees don't have as, as good of chemical defenses, root diseases are better able to attack those roots and kill them. So armillaria root disease, again, it's notorious for attacking drought-stressed drought stressed, uh, trees. And it's counterintuitive because we know that fungi, um, they like moisture, they sporulate um, more frequently when it's wetter outside and rain like raindrops are a, a major and rain splash from those raindrops falling are a primary way for fungi to spread so the way i think about it and this is true above ground too so take for example um black hill spruce in people's yards or white spruce or colorado blue spruce these trees um, frequently, it's almost inevitable that they will get needle cast diseases, um, which are caused by one of two organisms in Minnesota, stigmina needle cast and rhizosphera needle cast. It, it seems like stigmina needle cast is actually quite a bit more common than rhizosphera needle cast. Those fungi, they sporulate and they spread within tree canopies and from tree to tree much more efficiently during wetter climates. However, If a tree, they, they also cause what make what's caused latent infections. So that means that these pathogens, these, these fungi, they can infect plant tissue, but not cause disease until the tree is stressed. So you there it, it is possible that you can get more disease from these fungi during drought years or after drought years than during wet years. Wet years are when they spread. Drought years are when disease can manifest itself, actually. Okay, next one. Are the bark beetles you discuss the same as causing widespread death in the Black Hills? Is that ahead of ahead for us? So the, the bark beetle species that, that caused all the mortality out west in the Black Hills and out in the Rockies, out in the Canadian Rockies, um, there, those are different species of bark beetles than the ones that I described here in Minnesota. Um, the the most famous one of those Western North America species is called the mountain pine beetle, and there is concern in Minnesota in Minnesota that mountain pine beetle um, could be imported here. That's that's certainly a possibility. It's also possible that over time, because of a warming climate. It could actually naturally spread here through the boreal forest from Alberta all the way to northern Minnesota. There's like a jack pine bridge that connects northern Minnesota to, Al to Alberta where mountain pine beetle is native. Some scientists think that that will happen. Um, that wouldn't happen for a long time though. Um, but mountain pine beetle can kill our, it can attack and kill our trees. So there's concern about that. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about our native bark beetles. And I just mentioned ips. There are two very common ips in our state. Um, there's also There are also a lot of other very common bark beetles in, in, in our state that preferentially attack stressed trees. There's the bal balsam fir bark beetle. Of course, there's eastern larch beetle, which is run, running rampant in Minnesota. Um, just about every tree species has at least one bark beetle um, that attacks. Like down in Houston County, um, in the last two years, we've gotten an uptick in reports of shagbark hickory dying. And I've investigated a few of those sites. And the reason they're dying is because they're under attack by our native hickory bark beetle. Okay, this one's about maple tapping. Does tapping after a drought year impact the tree's health? I tap red maples in a mixed forest and am considering leaving most of them alone this spring. So when you tap 
when, when you expose any tree's sapwood, that is an injury. So if, if you're removing bark in any way, including tapping, and you're exposing the, the cambium and the sapwood, that's a little injury. Um, when a tree is healthy and not stressed, it can grow over small wounds very easily, and there is minimal impact. Um, minimal discoloration inside the, the sapwood um, and minimal decay. If a tree is stressed for whatever reason, it heals over wounds much more slowly. Also, um, whenever you have the sapwood of a tree exposed to the air, you're having thousands and thousands of fungal de decay spores that are nat part of naturally part of our environment. They're landing on that sapwood. They're germinating if the environmental conditions are moist enough, and, and they're growing. And so, uh, a stressed tree is unable to slow down those infections relative to a healthy tree. So, this is difficult to say because tapping maples is a really fun activity. Um, but if you wanted to do everything you could to protect your trees, and I'd say if you were a hobby tapper, you know, you just you're just doing it for fun, it's not your business or anything. I would closely, I would carefully, I would seriously consider not tapping this year if you had a severe drought last year, and if you had like three severe droughts in a row, which in some areas of Minnesota that is the case. I'd strongly consider not tapping because again, those wounds are going to close slower and you're going to get more decay occurring over time. Now, this is just like me being super cautious. Um, I, I would, you know, maybe <laughs> I've seen people kind of really abuse sugar maples too, or, or maples and put like a lot of taps in there. Maybe, maybe you're putting two taps in a tree. Maybe you should just only put one tap in a tree. Maybe you're maybe traditionally you tap like a lot of trees, some of which are just have are unhealthy anyways. I wouldn't tap those this year. Next one. I've noticed more marisent leaves on oaks than in years past. Could this be due to environmental stress or it mostly weather cues from the freakish warm weather we've had. <laughs> okay, so I think the way you pronounce that, Lauren, is marquescence. Yes, sorry. <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm no English major here. Um, there, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote a poem about marquescence on oaks. It's super cool. I wish I had it for you all. I'd read it. It's very cool. But anyways, um. Marquescence refers to trees that rather than shedding their fall leaves, those leaves stick up in the canopy um, all sometimes all winter and they don't fall off until the tree leaves out the following spring. Um, oaks commonly do this, but several other um, of our tree genera do it too. Um, like ironwood, for example, some people call it Eastern hop hornbeam. Um, so it's not surprising that you'd see more marquescence this winter um, because also when a tree, for example, an oak or a birch or an aspen, when they're attacked by some of these flat-headed wood borers, like two-line chestnut borer, um, those trees, those the branches that are attacked, they'll die before they can go through the fall leaf color and leaf shedding process. And so those leaves will just stick up in the canopy for a really long time. And so it's it's very possible that people are seeing more marquescence this year because of actually attack by um by bronze birch borers and and flat-headed wood borers. Um, but as for I mean, there might be an uh an effect of drought too with how much marquescence is happening. I don't know. And I think people like scientists over the years still haven't figured out exactly why marquescence happens. 
Or maybe you did say it right to begin with. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's all right. Um, these two are both the same question, essentially. Um, after oaks start to decline, is there anything property owners can do to prevent further decline in remaining trees? Um, in all reality, uh, yes, there, there are things that people can do, particularly when we're talking about ornamental trees or trees and yards. Um, I, I, I said this during the presentation. Now I'll, I'll say it again, cause I think it's so crucial. If, if you're concerned, it, you know, if you're starting to see decline, in in your yard oaks i think the most important thing and i think it's critical to do to protect your other trees is to ensure that they're not drought stressed um these keep in mind that these insects and armillaria they're native organisms they're opportunists they can't easily attack and overcome a healthy tree's defenses and so it is crucial if you like if you have a tree that it, you it would just kill you to lose it it's really important to make sure that tree has sufficient water and again saying that it's much easier said than done because watering you know watering uh a, a big old 200 year old baroque is that's that's serious water right there um you know personally I would invest a lot more in my 200 year old bur oak than my yard, my grass, because grass turf that can be replaced. You cannot replace, um, in your lifetime or in your kid's lifetime, a 200 year old bur oak. Um, that's just my opinion though. So watering is crucial. There are insecticide injections that people, people can, people can do themselves. They can hire arborists to do that their insecticides and so they will kill a few um like over like uh boring flat-headed wood borers that are boring in that cambian area but they'll also prov kill the adults that nibble on the leaves a little bit and they will also kill eggs that that while well, developing larvae that are hatching from eggs and, and those are expensive injections. Um, but if you want to protect your tree from attack by, of two line chestnut borer, bronze birch borer, bronze poplar borer, and it's in a yard and you have a lot, quite a bit of money to burn, you could, you could get some quotes for, for some arborists that could inject your trees with, um, some of these insecticides and they should protect the tree from, significant damage as long as those trees are watered the thing i really want to stress to people is that insecticides they aren't going to do anything to prevent armillaria root disease so even if you inject if you hire an arborist to inject your tree with an insecticide that's great for protecting that tree for, from flat-headed wood borers but it but the tree still needs to be watered And then we have, should we be mulching? If so, all species question. Well, in yards, um, mulching, if done properly, doesn't hurt at all. It helps. Um, I'm no mulching expert, to be honest with you. I mean, it, it helps uh, retain more moisture in the soil immediately under the mulched zone. It also dissuades people from driving over it and and walking over it, compacting the soil more. Um, I think that some kind of some research I've heard described from research projects out of the uh, Morton Arboretum have described how encouraging native plants growing underneath trees might be kind of a better way to accomplish the same thing that mulch does. I do know that you can mulch too deep. I believe the recommendation is three inches away from the trunk and three inches deep, but no deeper than three inches. Because again, those roots underneath the mulch layer, they need oxygen. And if you pile too much mulch up there, you're going to reduce the amount of oxygen in the rooting zone.
But in general, yes, mulching is good. I showed that link here. There are some guidelines for mulching there and extension certainly has um, some really good guidelines on mulching too. This person is asking, how far do records go back when you say like the 10th or 11th driest year um, is just looking for like a tier, a clear time frame of what yep. you're talking about? 1895. So that's 129 years of, of continuous weather records. And then this one, I have about five acres of old burr oak trees, 150 plus years and about five to 10 trees that suddenly died this past year. Odd for bur bur oak, right? <laughs> because it usually takes a few years for bur oaks to die. We had an arborist come take samples three times and they couldn't detect oak wilt, but they swear that was what was taking down our trees. I would like another opinion. Have you seen old bur oaks die that quickly outside of oak wilt? Could it be drought, fungus, or so on? So I have come to the point in my career where um, I, I just think diagnosing problems on white oak, Quercus alba, or bur oak, Quercus macrocarpa, they're both in the white oak group. It's so difficult. Um, I don't trust myself anymore. I used to think I could differentiate, I could identify oak wilt sometimes on Baroque. And sometimes I think I still can, but almost always, I wouldn't move forward with a solid diagnosis of oak wilt on bur oak or white oak unless I had a lab positive confirmation. Um, certainly, Things, certain, some things could kill a bur oak faster than oak wool, certainly. Extreme long flooding could do could do that, could could kill a, a large bur oak quicker than oak wool. Um, and I think probably the same thing could be said for extreme, extreme drought um, over a couple, maybe a two to three consecutive growing seasons. It wouldn't surprise me if drought combined with armillaria and two-lane chestnut borer could kill a, a bur oak quicker than oak wilt. Um, I've seen oak wilt kill like a, a four to five inch diameter small bur oak that's like 15, 20 feet tall in one growing season. And it looked almost exactly like how oak wilt kills red oaks in one growing season where you lose 90% of the leaves. They fall off in about one month or maybe two months. I've seen that happen, but I've also seen oak wilt kill like a quarter of a 200 year olds, 200 year old Baroque's canopy one year, um, maybe with the remainder a third. I mean, it, you know, Baroque's might take, they say one to seven years for oak wilt to kill them. But I think right now we're in this era of so many stresses to, to these older baroques that it is just so difficult to diagnose them. And admittedly, it seems like it's harder for laboratories to, to um, extract the oak wilt pathogen from um, white oak, the white oak groups, tissues. Um, but again, you know, and it, it's it's also crucial for people to know that when you're when you're submitting samples to the the disease clinic, a disease clinic for oak wilt confirmation, those samples still need to be living. You you don't want to send in dead samples. Um, you want to send in samples that are actively showing symptoms, um, and you want to keep those samples cool. If temperatures get too high, and if the oak wilt pathogen is in them, the oak wilt pathogen will die, and then the lab with a traditional test won't get oak wilt out. So it's crucial to, to cut down actively wilting branches, keeping them cool, and preferably getting those samples to the clinic the next day for good testing. 
Okay, next one here. What impacts do you anticipate from this very unusual winter we're experiencing? I don't know what to expect from this very unusual winter. I will just be totally honest with you all. Um, this winter, when you take a look at um, December and January temperatures, we've crushed the previous warmest winter, I think by like eight degrees. Don't quote me on that. Um, and so I don't think any, I don't think anyone's documented what's happened after a winter like this. Um, we certainly have had winters without snow cover, or we've had winters without snow cover for a long time. And if you have kind of a normal winter temperature regime during those snow free winters, frequently you, what happens to, to trees and forests is that fine roots near the soil surface are frozen to death and die, which results in widespread dieback and sometimes decline of some forests. Um, I don't know if we're going to see that after this winter. I don't know if the frost in the ground was significant enough to kill roots. I kind of doubt it. So um, the hopeful part of me is thinking that this, this highly unusual winter, we aren't going to see many negative results from it. Um, with the big caveat that I, I do expect early leaf out just across the board. And um, if we get any, any serious frost freezes after that leaf, 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 leaf out, I would expect those um, sensitive tissues that are growing, the, the new leaves, the new shoots that are extending, those would be killed. But that's nothing unusual at all for Minnesota's forests. I mean, that usually happens anyways to a lot of trees. Um, so it's just that would be just another stressor. But I think the the main problem here is drought, right? The, the most recent problem is drought. But we will see with this winter. We'll see what happens. Next is, can you expand on the problems caused by fertilizing trees? I have a burr oak with blight in my backyard and a professional forester recommended arbokelp fertilization. I'm glad you asked that. Um, fertilizer generally, so here, here's a warning. I am not a soils expert. I'm not a fertilizer expert. I just know some very general, I know some generalities. One, one general rule is that fertilizers encourage above ground growth. So shoot growth over root growth. And when you have a tree that's recovering from any stress, what you really want to promote is root growth. You don't want to promote shoot growth for a tree that's recovering. And so I would, I would strongly avoid for any tree that's recovering from stress, I would strongly avoid any fertilizer that encourages shoot growth. Um, also, some insects are more attracted to fertilized plants. Some of those insects that are more fertile, that more attracted to fertilized plants actually do better with droughts too. So that's another reason maybe to strongly consider not fertilizing. But another very important message is I'm no soils expert. I'm no fertilizer expert. If you're going to invest in any sort of fancy fertilizer or any fertilizer at all for your tree, you better get a soils test. Um, because you'll see this in literature, old literature, new literature, all over. Our trees almost never need fertilizers. They almost never need nutrients. Again, there's a time and a place for it, but before investing in it, I would I would get a soils test through the University of Minnesota soils lab. What our trees need right now almost certainly is water. Um, also, keep in mind the the questioner asked to mention blight. They were probably referring to burr oak blight. Um, burr oak blight is a native disease. It's a native leaf disease that 
people like me have have kind of documented as increasing a lot since about 1990. Of course, that's correlated strongly with uh, weather that's that's been really wet. And the disease is prolific across the landscape, very common after really wet springs. After dry years, like the last two years, we hardly document any Baroque blight. The other thing is we've done some minor monitoring uh, over the over the last couple decades, and we've shown that Baroques that get Baroque blight almost every year, they remain healthy. And um, I'm just from my work, I'm strongly in the camp of if your Baroque is seems to be actually suffering in health because of Baroque blight, it's got other things wrong with it, like previous root damage, so on and so on. Just a few things. Uh, I, actually, we didn't get to all the questions, Brian, but uh, we really thank you for today. We will try and get back to the questions of people that were, were not answered, or the questions that weren't answered. Thank you for Charlie and Eli for plugging in some uh, web links and so forth there. Uh, Brian's email is there. I'm sure you could uh, access that uh, email and and uh, uh, ask some questions that way too, Brian. Uh, but we really appreciate your attendance today. Uh, we do have some more Fridays with a Forester coming up. And being you're registered for this class, you should be registered for the rest of them. As you leave today's Zoom, uh, you'll be asked some questions. There'll be an a evaluation and there'll be four questions. If you could answer some of those, your, your uh, survey is anonymous. And we'd like your comments on today's webinar and actually future webinars. Uh, also, all of our webinars are recorded on uh, basically a Z link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. And then if you're interested in uh, getting our uh, Minnesota Woods uh, email, if you don't get those newsletters, certainly can uh, email us at that uh, Z link for Minnesota, my Minnesota Woods. And thank you for joining us today for uh, Fridays with a Forester. And we look forward to the next time. Thank you.